All right, everyone, we're going to get started. Uh, welcome. My name is Alexis Bonagowski, and I am the program manager for the Sustainable Ranching Initiative for World Wildlife Fund. And this is our um, second webinar that we're doing about our ecological and bird monitoring program for our RSVP ranches. And so generally today, what we want to do is just be able to go over the monitoring work that we're doing, what we're monitoring, how it's being monitored, what you're going to see in your monitoring reports. If you were monitored in 2022 and you don't have your soil health stuff, you can still um, see an example of a ranch report that you'll get. Um, and this is your opportunity to ask questions of our science team. So Adam Dixon, who will be leading us through the presentation, and then also Patrick Lindrum, who is here, who's our um, science manager. In addition, we have our SRI team um, that you guys all know, depending on which ranch um, or where you're located. So we have Aaron Clausen in Montana. Um, and I'd like to introduce Caitlin Gillespie, who is our new, um, new staff member who lives up in Malta, which we're really excited about. And then we've got Kate Rasmussen in South Dakota, and we've got Ann Dvorak in Nebraska. So we've, and then we've got Leah, who is our, um, our intern this summer, who's working on our Beaver Dam analog uh, program. So we've got a whole crew here to answer your questions. And I'm gonna turn it over to Adam to get us started. And if you have questions as we go, just um, you can put them in the chat or you can unmute and just stop Adam and ask him while he's, um, while he's chatting. Any, anything works for us, we'll monitor the chat and make sure your questions get answered. Okay, I'm gonna turn it over to Adam. Thanks, Alexis. All right. How's that look? Is that full screen for everybody? Okay, yeah, so uh, like Alexis said, um, feel free to um, ask questions. We kind of envision this to be very conversational and um, we you know, left time in here for, um, uh, questions along the way. Um, so feel free, don't feel, don't feel shy. Like let's treat this as more of a conversation than a presentation. Uh, but hopefully we can um, get through these two reports. Not hopefully, we will. Um, so uh, I'll just get started. I'm kind of rambling. It's Monday morning, so I haven't really, I'm not firing on all cylinders yet. Um, all right, so here we go. So this is the state of RSVP monitoring. Um, we are in our third year, um, but uh, so in 2021, uh, we started with 16 ranches. Um, we have all our reports done for that. We're going to review our uh, vegetation and soil report for 2021 today. Um, and then for 2022, we have our bird reports done. So for the 2022 ranches, we thought we would review that bird report. So we'll sort of jump years on the reports. Um, and then for this year, we have 21 ranches on deck. Um, and that monitoring will get started next month. Um, and then we'll also repeat uh, all 16 of the uh, 2021 ranches. And so we're finally getting into the um, uh, into a place where we can uh, do repeat surveys, which kind of which is uh, shows us um, you know uh, what the change is across, uh, or 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 it'll it'll start to indicate some change across uh, time, which is kind of really what we're looking for. So yeah, so that's where we are. Um, and just wanted to review. Um, where the ecological monitoring sits within the RSVP program. Um, so our theory is that um, the ecology of your ranch uh, is related to um, your entire ranch system operation and you know, financial um, success. And so by understand, we're hoping that by understanding um, these basic ecological indicators that uh, ranch management will improve, which will 
uh, end up improving the, the grasslands of the Northern Great Plains, um, which is what we're after. Um, so I won't read through all of these ecological, ecological indicators, but I thought I would just sort of put them up here so we can see them all at the same time right now. But for the rest of the time, we're gonna kind of go through each of these one by one and, and talk through them. Uh, and so in this first part of the presentation, actually, I just wanted to go through and kind of show what the ranches look like across, uh, uh, across all the ranches. So we'll dive into a ranch report. We'll just show, we'll, we'll just show one ranch. But these are the results if you look at all the ranches um, in terms of soil, soil organic carbon here. Uh, you can see uh, the, the, the bright red bar is our lab samples. So these are the samples we can see in the picture, um, an illustration of it where we actually went out into the field, took a one meter soil core um, and shipped it to the lab and had it analyzed for soil organic carbon. Um, the sort of pinkish, orangish color, uh, which I have labeled as Sergo, that's a NRCS soil database that is an interpolation of soil organic carbon values and what it would estimate uh, the same location, the same data from the ranch would be. Um, and as we can see in the, the our lab re results over, um, was much higher than the Sergo estimate uh, for most of the locations. Um, you know, I, I think it's important maybe to state right now that just because there's a lot of variation doesn't mean that there's good there's good management or bad management going on at each ranch. Each ranch is its own has its own unique um, uh, it's a, it has its own unique ecosystem and its own unique properties that will uh, impact how high or low the number is. Um, so I don't think it's really, we're not look, looking for the highest number or um, or the lowest number in, in these, just to show that there's actually a lot of diversity in our ranches in 2021. And um, really what we, what we wanna see is when we come back and see if there's any changes to soil organic carbon um, as we build out the, the monitoring program across time. Um, so uh, another soil um, measure is wet aggregate stability, um, which is basically just soil clumping. It's like, how well does the soil clump? Um, and if the soil is clumping very uh, well, if there's big clumps, that's uh, indicative of more um, sort of biological processes happening in the soil. And so um, it's going to be much more resistant to like rain and wind and other uh, sort of weather impacts. And that means it's going to stand the ground and it's going to uh, contribute to plant growth and um, all around be much more uh, healthy, viable soil. Um, I think so. You can see that ranged uh, pretty um, well across all the ranches. Um, and basically, the measurement here is we say if it's if if above eighty percent of the soil is clumping, then that's excellent. But if less than thirty percent is clumping and it, you know and it's just loose soil, that's uh, not as not as good. So we'll call that poor. Uh, the next uh, measure is water infiltration, and I present here uh, the results. Uh, with our field-based measurement uh, along with the uh, NRCS estimate. Again, that's an uh, interpolation, so it's just uh, NRCS's best guess. Um, and you can see there's a, a wide variety. The air bars are a little silly because uh, we actually we only have three measurements on this uh, per ranch. And, um, and so if you have a high, if you have a place with sandy soils and then a place with clay soils, it's going to vary a lot. And so it's going to be like crazy air bars. But just just to let you know, um, we did it with a really uh, nice instrument. It's a uh, we used a um, this little um, water infiltration meter here. Um, it's sort of 
if you're familiar with the ring test where you just put water in a metal ring and then you time how, how long it takes the water to go down. This one actually, you put soil samples inside the instrument and then it takes like two hours and it does various tests to see how quickly the water moves through different soil, uh, soil measures. And so uh, this is a really accurate estimate of water infiltration. And um, we think water infiltration is important because if you change your management practices or if there's anything different, then uh, that it should lead to a, a, a different measure, a different number um, over time. Um, so uh, vegetation is another major component of the monitoring. Um, this is just sort of a uh, look at uh, the vegetation across uh, Montana and South Dakota in 2021. So um, I think if you added these together, um, it's a total of 80 plant species. Um, but you can kind of see what um, what the variety is. And I made a little word cloud here that that makes the uh, plant common names that were the most um, observed um, have bigger, uh, you know, font than um, than the ones that were less common. And so, you know, so basically, you know, we have a lot of cheatgrass, a lot of blue grama, lots of green needle grass, and lots of crested wheatgrass across across our ranches in 2021. Uh, and then uh, just overall for birds, and this is actually jumping ahead to 2022, um, we found that the Western meadowlark was the most common species. So it's really blurry, apologies, but it says 891 um, Western meadowlarks were seen or heard uh, while the bird uh, survey crew was out there. Um, the next most common were grasshopper sparrows, horn larks, and lark buntings, which is not a bad mix to have um, in your top uh, set of bird species that were observed. Um, and then I put this uh, graphic, this graph on the right, um, to show that um, management and habitat across a ranch is going to vary, and it's going to be good for different bird species, and that's that's a good thing. So really what we want to manage for in a lot of situations is a diversity of habitats because that's going to lead to um, uh, a larger uh, uh, um, set of characteristics that allow the different um, um, habitat requirements for, for different bird species across a ranch. And so just because you have excessive grazing in one place um, doesn't mean that it's all bad. But you also want to have places where you have light grazing on your ranch so that you um, have uh, places for other bird species. So just it's really just to show that um, um, management, a diversity of management is good for diversity of birds, I think is the ultimate point. All right, so that is it. So I'll stop there. And if anybody has any questions, now would be a wonderful time to um, talk about it. Otherwise, I'll jump over to the reports. I guess uh, this is Dale V. Seth. I had one question. Hey, Dale. Sure. Um, <clears throat> I've got <clears throat> several partners and that I, I really like your printout or your soil vegetation summary. <clears throat> excuse me mm -hmm. and uh, I'd like to share that with some of my other partners uh, we partner with the Rancher Stewardship Alliance and uh, TNC and I was wondering if I could uh, have you send maybe a digital copy out to those guys yeah I think that's something we can do I, I guess my other question is, is uh, when we saw Montana one and two, I'm, I'm from Montana, but uh, I'll, how do you know your ranch number? Well, we kept that, um, to, we, 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 we wanted that to be a little bit anonymous right now because some people will be more sensitive to sharing their ranch information than others. 
Um, and so really for us, that's more of an internal number. Um, and, um, you know, we use it for getting all the information together and things like that. But I think for sharing that out uh, with the community, we're not really, um, I, it, I, I think that's less important. But I would be happy to tell you which ranch yours was um, later on. If you want to see where your ranch is with, with all the others, yeah, we could definitely let you know. Okay. Yeah. And also, uh, it's good timing. Uh, we appreciate you giving us permission to use your ranch report uh, in this. Um, so, uh, so we will go through all your information right now. Any other questions? Okay. Well, so now we'll, we'll run through the 2021 soil and vegetation report. Um, uh, like, like I said, we'll, we'll run through uh, Dale's report because he gave us permission uh, to use it. And uh, your, all the other reports will be very similar. Uh, we use the exact same template for all, all of them. And um, so it'll just be different numbers and slightly different interpretation in some places. Um, so we start the report out with uh, an executive summary, which, which provides a synopsis of everything that we, that we looked at. Um, and I just highlighted some key, key stats here. Um, there's a lot more to it. Uh, but these are just some things that we can kind of run through real fast. Um, first, we, we start out by pointing out the most common vegetation species. We give a number for um, how much uh, vegetation product, you know, productivity we found, which we measured in three locations on each ranch. Um, we talk about... Um, what the historic versus uh, current uh, amount of bare surface is. Um, and then we provide some yeah, soil results. So I think I actually forgot. I did, this is a mess up right here. But anyways, and then we go through some key findings, um, what the total soil organic carbon was, what the soil aggregation, uh, what the water infiltration rate was, and so on. Um, and so that is our opening page. And then we dive into uh, much more detail on every component of the report. So uh, the VSETH uh, and VSETH Ranch is located in the uh, purple area here, which is, um, it's a ecosystem map, basically. Um, it's called the Brown Glaciated Plains and the Northern Rolling Hills Plains. Um, and in this area, uh, we would expect similar ecological conditions. And so if there was another ranch in another location in the purple area, we would expect, uh, expect it to have a similar ecology. And so if you had similar management, um, you might see the same response there to, to all of these this similar um, metrics that we go through. Hey, Adam, can I jump in yeah, real quick? Absolutely. Cool. Um, and I just want everyone to remember that this, the monitoring, this is just a moment in time on the ranch and not to place value judgments on, it's just information, information and data collected at one moment. And in a, we need to put it in a context of weather and climate and various other factors. So I, I want to make sure everyone knows that it's not, um, you know, a value judgment. So if you see something in your report that's like, it's just information and hopefully over time with additional monitoring, we can see changes that will then um, tell us a bigger story, but that this first report, you know, is just information from certain points on your ranch. So to just take that as you look at your report, just always keep that in the, in the back of your head. Thanks, Alexis. Um, yeah, so anyways, so this is where the VSETH Ranch is located. And um, so we talk a little bit about that. And then we talk about our sample design. 
Um, and so each ranch has 20 points uh, on it. And um, we developed a, um, a set of a map that uses a bunch of different characteristics to choose uh, where those points would be located. So we, we, we created a map with things like land aspect, so the direction of the slope, um, the actual slope, like the percent, like if, is it 5% slope or is it 10%? Um, the soil texture, which is basically how much clay content you have in the soil, how deep your soil layers are um, between different, the two top horizons. Um, and that's gonna be, you know, that's going to indicate how deep the plant roots can go, basically. And then uh, land cover, which is a very general description of um, what is on top of the land. So like, is it cropland? Is it rangeland? Is it wooded, et cetera? Um, and so we put all of those characteristics together and then uh, created a random sample of 20 points in those. Um, and in that way, we hope to uh, capture um, a representation of your ranch with just 20 points, because that's the challenge is like we want the information to be um, to, to reflect what's what's actually happening, but we only have 20 opportunities to do that. And so we had to come up with a systematic way to uh, choose where to put these points, but also in a non-biased way so that we're not picking and choosing where we, where we go. Um, and uh, anyway, so, so, so then we can say that these are uh, accurate and um, unbiased. And that's really important, especially when you get to statistics and stuff like that later on. Um, and then it also is just, it, um, it's honest. It makes it honest. Um, so for the VSETH Ranch, when you put these, these uh, different site characteristics together, there are two big groups uh, that popped out. And so we use those two groups to choose where to put the points. Um, and uh, we provide some basic statistics on those. So how many sample points were in each group and then how much of the total ranch, like in a percentage is in, in those groups. And so, uh, the VSETH Ranch, which is um, quite large, um, had 15,000 acres in this first group and almost 13,000 acres in the second group. Um, so anyway, so we sort of go into some depth about how that worked and uh, what the sample groups were for you and your ranch. Oops. And then we provide a map. And uh, since the VSETH ranch is so big, it, it doesn't show up real good. So when you have a ranch that's longer than wide or whatever, it kind of doesn't fit perfectly. So I apologize for that. But um, it basically shows uh, where our two sample groups were. So it gives the different colors. And then it shows the different points. And so uh, we have four different point type point types. Uh, the first one I'll point out is these ones that start with VC and then a number, and that stands for vegetation and carbon. Uh, and so that's a carbon point. The W is for water, so water infiltration. And then uh, SA is soil aggregation. So that's our soil clumping uh, measure. And then we also have vegetation biomass, which is, um, which is the little uh, green ones. And those actually correspond with uh, the vegetation and carbon ones too, but it shows which of those were uh, the, bio the biomass or the productivity sampling. Um, and that was just on three locations. So, um, so yeah, so that's kind of how the map is interpreted. Uh, and then we'll go through and each table has um, the actual point, the point numbers and names. And so you can refer back to the map if you want to know where that point is located. Um, and we can sort of show that a little bit later on. Um, anyways, yeah, so I think the only other thing is we go into a little bit more depth about what an ecological site description is. Um, 
we use the ecological site description, which is uh, a, a a finer level ecosystem idea that the that NRCS puts together. Um, and it comes along with a lot of uh, additional, a lot of information about historic uh, and current conditions um, in the in the ecological sites. And so uh, they're basically based on um, soil types because soil drives a lot of the um, ecological processes. It's where it kind of starts. And so uh, it's kind of one of the most important, but it's defined as an ecologically unique area with specific characteristics, blah, 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 that produce a distinctive kind and amount of vegetation in response to management. And so that's the idea is that it's a tool that can help us understand um, the historic and um, the historic conditions and how management leads to different differences in what we're currently seeing. Um, and then, so we try to put all this information in the context of that. Um, and we provide uh, you know, a couple paragraphs about what the historic site conditions were, what the historic ESD uh, suggested was at the VSETH ranch you know, over, over the past uh, you know, 100 years or so. It goes goes back kind of far, but not like, 10,000 years or anything. Um, and this figure, which I, I, I wanted to point it out, but it's it's not uh, the best figure. They were a little bit, the NRCS needs a, a round of funding for their ecological site descriptions. <laughs> but, um, but they uh, already have some really great information put together. And basically what it shows is that given different management, uh, you're going to have different outcomes based on the historic site conditions. And so um, it, this is called a state in transition model. And um, basically it shows that uh, what the site might be transitioning into based on what the management practices were. And so we have like four different options we're given here. We have the contemporary reference state, which is like that historic uh, state without um, cattle management, without you know private property and all that that makes up what the Northern Great Plains is today. Uh, and then we have an invaded state, which is like if uh, invas invasive species move in, if we planted seeds from um, with you know grasses that are non-native, uh, how that might change the site. Um, we have a short grass state and um, a post cropland state. So say if the site was turned into crop and then moved back into pasture, what we might, what kind of vegetation community we might see. So that's just to provide you a little more information on, on that. We, th we thought that was interesting enough to share. So um, yeah. So after that, after the historic context that in the report, we, we sort of dive into the numbers. And we start with soils, and we, we've already looked at some of the soil organic carbon um, stuff. So we provide those numbers here. We provide it in a table format. Um, our sample groups are based, you know, the same groups we talked about before. Uh, we had three, three different um, measurements in that sample group. And so this is actually an important point. Um, that uh, for the soil organic carbon, we had um, we took composite samples because it's really expensive to get uh, individual samples, and so um, ultimately that uh, we wanted to get uh, five or six samples per ranch of soil organic carbon. So we took samples that were in the same sample group and uh, put them together, basically just mixed up that soil and um, derive the value. And so this is kind of like similar to what the graph we were looking at before. We have our lab-based measurement of that, and we have our SERGO, which is our NRCS interpolation value. Um, so this is just in table format, oops. And then we provide it in graph format too. 
this graph is basically, uh, you can see the zero is here and then we have a negative 100 here. So it's kind of like thinking about looking at uh, the soil surface down, what the um, soil organic carbon is expected to be. And so from the zero to 30, minute, uh, 30 centimeter uh, depth, uh, we have that first line, then we have 30 to 50 centimeters, and then 50 centimeters to 100 centimeters, which is one meter. And, um, and then I color them based on how uh, high the value was. And so we can see we're, you know, always, um, always higher than what the Sergo value was estimating. Um, yeah. So then we go into solar uh, aggregate stability or our soil clumping and provide a table here and we provide that that quality rating. Um, and on the VSETH ranch, we basically could say that the soil quality is medium to good based on how many, um, how much of the soil was clumping. And we, just to get a, into a little more detail, we looked at big clumps, macro aggregates, and small clumps, micro aggregates. And so that total aggregates is how much, uh, it, is these two values added together. Um, all right, so then we move into soil uh, water infiltration. We go into some depth about uh, what the type of instrument we used was, uh, why it's important, and uh, provide the values here in graph and in, or sorry, in table and then graph format compared with the NRCS estimate. And then we also put uh, the plants listed here uh, just to provide some additional context. It, it's not really very meaningful. We don't exactly know. Um, uh, we don't exactly think this measurement is affected by this, but it's just kind of good to know and you know provide some additional site characteristics for that number. Um, yeah, I'll stop here and see if anybody has any questions. Oh, right. I will keep moving then. I have a quick question. Oh, sure. Um, yeah, I was just curious about when you're measuring the macro and micro aggregates, um, what kind of, you know, reference scale are you using or how is that being measured? reference scale like in terms of what the size of like the... what constitutes yeah like what constitutes micro and macro and um oh yeah so we used let's see so we we provide those numbers here so uh a, a macro aggregate is considered two millimeters to uh, uh, 0.25 millimeters and then uh, uh mi micro aggregates are uh, 0.25 to, so I guess that's getting smaller. Yeah, so 0.25 to 0.053. Thanks. Does that answer your question? Yeah. And I think we got that from the NRCS. I think they provided that reference, those reference numbers. Um, okay, so any other questions? Okay, moving into vegetation. Um, yeah, I think we'll just, you know, basically um, we go into some detail about what it means in terms of management, and then we provide just the, the basic table uh, and the total cover in the 20, uh, 20 places that we looked. And so on the VSETH Ranch, Crested Wheatgrass uh, was 25% uh, of the total cover. Uh, Lesser Spike Moss was 11, Blue Gramma, at almost 10% and so on. And so these are all the different species that we identified. Uh, then we provide some, um, some cover estimates. So we have bare ground, fine litter, um, perennial grass, annual grass, and shrub cover. So we provide those uh, in terms of the sample groups. So kind of, this is, this is basically if, uh, our our estimate of what these conditions are pretty much across the ranch um, in 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 our two different sample groups. So um, then we provide the vegetation biomass numbers, and we converted those numbers to pounds per acre. 
And then we also provided what the plant species were that we identified at that location. And we provide some historical context as well in the paragraphs. Um, so you can uh, read more there. And then we created this graph, which is from um, historic remote sensing data. So this was uh, a, this is a pretty cool information product from the University of Montana. And um, it's called the RAP data set, the Rangeland Analysis um, Program, if you've ever heard of it. But basically, it provides uh, vegetation productivity estimates going all the way back to 1986. And it divides the vegetation up into perennial and annual vegetation. Um, and then, of course, that top line is, is those two numbers put together, is added together. Um, and basically, you can just kind of see how um, how the total vegetation productivity has varied over time. Uh, this is uh, for within your the entire ranch boundary. So it doesn't really pick up on the nuance across the ranch, uh, but it provides an overall value. Um, in future reports, we're hoping to get this down to the pasture level so that we can kind of pick up more on um, changes in um, you know, smaller places on your ranch and particular management approaches in different places. That's kind of what we're thinking. Uh, we also provide the precipitation uh, over time uh, since vegetation productivity is driven largely by the uh, precipitation. We thought this was a useful um, measure to put in here, but it's also uh, the precipitation within your entire ranch boundary uh, going back in time um, and so on. So, so yeah, so that basically makes up the report. Um, we provide some additional information in the appendix, which plant species were observed at each location. So you can look at the, basically take this number and go back to your map and, and look at exactly what the plant species were observed here. And then we provide this bare ground percentage number um, for each location. Um, we also provided a lot more information on the ecological site description. Uh, each, each ranch had, has a lot of different ecological sites because these are very small ecosystems that we're talking about here. And so um, basically for every major soil type you have in your ranch, you're going to have uh, a different ecological site description. So in case you wanted more information, we put it here. We didn't really think you needed it, and we we did our best to put put the information together in the um, best possible way. But we just wanted to provide more information, and so that's what this is. Um, okay, so that is the vegetation and soil report. Any questions? Can you guys see my screen? <laughs> yeah. Yep. Okay. Good. It's like a website, though, for like Amazon. I don't know if that's what you mean to be showing us. <laughs> Shoot. Can you see the Rasmussen Ranch now? Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. So we're good. All right. Let's go full screen. All right. So any questions about soil bed or should I keep, keep plowing ahead? I think I'm talking kind of slowly. So we're already at 40 minutes. Um, okay. So the uh, Rasmussen Ranch uh, gave us permission to look at their bird reports. They're a 2022 ranch. Uh, so this was last summer. And um, yeah, so we have custom reports. So we have 38 of these um, and we have sent these out already. So everybody should have their, their bird, bird reports by now. And they're structured in a lot of the same format. We provide the the executive summary, you know, an introduction, talk about uh, why we did what we did, where where we did it, who we worked with, uh, what our approach is, and so on. And then we provide um, some basic uh, summary statistics for, you know, what birds we saw, how many bird surveys we conducted, how many birds we found. So we found 123. Um, and we provide some additional information in there. Uh, and then we also provide 
uh, some context about um, how important we think the bird species are in terms of um, uh, as a management indicator or as a rare species. So um, just provides a map of kind of what what the area we're looking at. This is our northern Great Plains and kind of like the uh, sections of the of that. Um, I'll keep moving here. Um, this table is all the birds that we think are key rangeland indicators. So these birds respond well to um, management practices and different habitat uh, types. And so um, if you see these species, it kind of indicates um, A, something good is going on, and um, B, that it's kind of a unique species. Um, this map just shows like where our uh, 2022 ranches were. Uh, we had 38, so a lot more points spread across Montana. Uh, and then we also had some uh, Nebraska ranches in 2022, which is a first, and then Wyoming. Um, we had a couple ranches. So we provide a uh, kind of an overview of, of all of that, how many birds we saw across each state um, and um, how many survey points, et cetera. Um, so the bird reports go into a little bit more to the habitat type uh, idea. So we had, um, uh, we, we divided it up into grassland, sagebrush, shrub steppe, et cetera these different habitat types, and they provided um, how many points were in each of these. So basically it provides context as we look at this table down here, we can kind of uh, see that most of these birds represent grassland birds. Uh, we also had some sagebrush and uh, cropland birds, for example, but those are gonna be less likely to be seen because we weren't in those places. So we're more likely to see grassland birds uh, across the ranches. Uh, and we already looked at this. Uh, this is just the total birds all the way down to the, to the very uh, least observed. So we thought that was kind of interesting. Uh, I thought it was cool that the Eastern metal arc was seen one time, uh, whereas the Western metal arc was seen uh, you know, almost 900 times. So we're definitely in Western metal arc uh, country in the Northern Great Plains. We saw a bald eagle too. That was uh, only one time though. Um, all right, so this is just uh, a map of where the points were located. We didn't do 20 points, we did uh, just 10. It takes quite a while to do a bird survey. So 10 is a much more um, reasonable number uh, for, for a ranch. Uh, and we selected the points based on where those vegetation and soil carbon tests were because the idea is that we want to kind of eventually be able to put all this data together um, and see um, how changes in, in each location kind of lead to differences in across our metrics. So bird, soil, and um, uh, vegetation. Um, and then we get into some more specific ranch numbers. So on the Rasmussen Ranch, um, Actually, oh, over here, yeah, there it is. We found we had ten survey points. Uh, we had an average of twelve birds per survey point, and we found one hundred twenty-three birds. Um, and then we provide uh, a table of all our. Um, let's see. All our all the, oh the species of concern. Yeah, sorry, I, I didn't know exactly how we characterize this, but these are our species of concern. And then if it's a check mark. It's our uh, WWF species. And if it's in here, it's a uh, state species of concern because state uh, wildlife programs have different um, ways that they uh, characterize uh, bird, uh, birds as well. So uh, that's provided. And this is in, in this case, this is South Dakota. All right, so, um, as I was talking about before, um, the different habitat types on the Rasmussen Ranch, all, all the survey points were in grassland habitat. And then we provide some more information on 
um, on habitat characteristics and, and birds. Um, I'd like to point out this table. It shows the additional bird species that we uh, saw, but we that we weren't at point counts. And so the the uh, yeah the thing about the point count is that it doesn't we can't record the species unless we're there and we started the timer. Um, even if we see a bird and it's not uh, during our specific time of observation, it doesn't count. Um, but these are the birds that we saw that we that uh, thought were interesting, but didn't necessarily count towards the official the official number. And so we saw bobolinks and horned larks, long billed curlews. These are um, um, people get excited when they see bobolinks and curlews. Basically, um, we saw some grouse. We saw some wild turkeys, uh, etc. So that's those birds. We wanted to record them and say that we saw them, but in a different location than our official count. And that's what that is. Um, and then we go into some uh, habitat characteristics uh, and birds. So the bird numbers versus the habitat characteristics. This graph basically just shows what the habitat types that they saw on each point um, was in terms of uh, from zero to 100%. So each, each bar kind of represents 100%. And then each number represents how much of that slice is in these different habitat uh, types. So shrub, shrub grass, tall grass, bare ground, that kind of thing. And so that's what that represents. And then um, the graph on the bottom represents uh, how many birds were seen at each point. In relation to this green behind here is how many how much veg, how much uh, vegetation diversity we saw as well. So it's like it's kind of like ha if we would sometimes expect there to be when there's a lot of plants you can you, a lot of plant species you would also expect a lot of bird species. There's often a correlation like a st statistical correlation between that because it indicates there is a lot of uh, potential habitat. Um, types within that little area, because when you have different plants, plant types and different plant species, you have different uh, plant heights and, you know, it creates a lot of different types of vegetation structure. And so um, it leads to that relationship. And so that's kind of why we put this graph together. Um, so we can see how many birds versus how many, um, uh, how many plants we saw. Um, it's only 10 points, so it's not really enough to say anything definitively, but we're just put, providing some context here. Um, and then uh, we end the report uh, by uh, going through each of our WWF uh, rangeland indicator species and how many we saw on your ranch. Um, and then we provide information about what, what types of habitat they have. And so if it's zero, uh, there were, we didn't see any of any of these. A lot of them you're not going to see because they're not in your range. Like I don't think you have prairie chickens in Montana. Um, do you? You're more of sage. Do you have some? No, that's right, Adam. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm actually. Uh, I live in Wichita, Kansas, and we have we're prairie chicken country. So uh, we we don't have we we have very few sage grouse. Some in the western part of the state, but. Um, mostly we, when we talk about, um, we talk about prairie chickens, which are a grouse, uh, in the grouse family. Um, anyways, uh, moving on, uh, on the Rasmussen Ranch, we saw a golden eagle. We saw a couple upland sandpipers, and we saw a bunch of dick thistles and grasshopper sparrows, which are good indicator species. And then we provide information on what their habitat types are like. So that's just kind of more information for you to uh, look and understand what, what kind of habitat types um, are needed to support these types of species. So uh, Western meadowlark, which is our most common, and we provide uh, some information there. And so that is it. Um, and now uh, I think we have 10 minutes left. So, um, you know, any questions, any conversation points, kind of anything we want to talk about now um, is fair game. Thanks for 
Thanks for your attention. Uh, this is uh, Dale Vseth again. I'm not sure we've seen a bird report for this year. Uh, well, you're a 2021 ranch, so uh, you won't have one for this year, for 2022. Um, but we will be on your ranch this summer, and so you'll have one next year. Okay. Yep. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, Adam, what is the frequency of visits for bird, soil, veg? How often are you going to be doing those? Um, we're uh, doing it every other year. So it's it's a little bit, um, it's, we're, we're trying to do it every other year right now. Um, we have funding for, you know, to repeat our 2021 ranches in 2023 uh, this year. And then we'll repeat our 2022 ranches in 2024. And I'm not sure if, if we know exactly what we'll do in 2025, but, um, but that's kind of how we're looking at it right now. Um, if any of my colleagues want to jump in here and help me out, I'd appreciate it. Uh, but that's, that's how we're thinking about it. Is that, it, would you guys concur? Yeah, we, so our original funding for RSVP was five years. So the original monitoring schedule was based on that five-year pilot and as we fundraise to continue RSVP, we'll be um, kind of developing like what does the monitoring look like uh, post 2025 so that we can, because um, monitoring is one of the most expensive pieces of RSVP. Um, and we wanna make sure that we're not over monitoring and we're on actually a schedule that makes sense for um, the indicators that we're looking at. And so, um, currently, we're working on what does it look like post 2025. And so if you guys have um, ideas, thoughts, we're always looking for feedback on what makes the most sense for um, monitoring indicators and management. Um, so we'll be letting you know as we fundraise and as we try to develop the program past that point. Thanks, Alexis. So I got a question for you, Adam. When you guys are out monitoring your your birds, do you ever uh, take note of uh, ground predators that you see along you know along the way? Just because I think there's a direct relation on on these ranches, a uh, ground predator like coyotes, foxes, you know, etc. I think they've I feel they've gotten kind of out of control. And since I was a kid, when we used to, when, when everybody in my area used to raise sheep, the predators were kind of controlled. And I seen a lot more birds at that point. And at this point, I, you know, we, everybody's stopped raising sheep and, you know, and killing predators has been a big issue. So I see the predators have increased and bird numbers have went down. Is there any any way or any is there any anybody tracking any of that kind of information out there i mean that's a great observation uh and grassland birds are very vulnerable to uh predators obviously because they nest on the ground and that's why they're called grassland birds um but we're not tracking it so it's a great point but no we uh, we haven't had that idea yet, uh, but that's what that's why these are so valuable. I mean, I I think that's a good idea, and I think um, I'm gonna talk to our bird people about it um, when we are setting we're we're setting it up right now. So um, so so no so but you're right. It is there is a relationship for sure, um, but uh, but we're not tracking it. Is it Patrick? Can you help me out here? You have any thoughts on that, or um, or anybody else? No, I think the short of it is, yeah, you're right. No, not something we're tracking currently. Yeah, but it's a good point. Uh, 
uh, this is Dale here, and I'd like to throw out that uh, in the last 10 years, we've seen a lot more ravens and crows. Um, as a kid, I'm 60 years old now, and as a kid, I can't ever receive, uh, uh, to me, they're kind of an invasive predator, if you will, uh, for this area, and now they're, they're very common. That's interesting. I haven't, um, I haven't heard that, but, but yeah, I mean, uh, I think that uh, it's not surprising necessarily, um, you know, bird, certain bird species are um, always changing across, across places, um, you know, based on, you know, management. A lot of it is on, you know, this is a, this is a managed landscape. And so, uh, my my personal opinion is the bird species and a lot of the species that we see are a result of that. And I'm not to say that it's it's always bad or anything, but um, but yeah, but it's probably because you know raven and crow habitat and um, it it has increased, and the prey you know they have plenty to eat and all of that. I just was going to point out that I've I've also noticed that what Dale was saying that there's an increase in crows. So hmm. I also want to mention that if um, Adam and Adam can put his uh, email if you don't have it in the chat, but if you guys have any questions on the reports as you're going through them, um, we're all, Adam, <laughs> I'm not going to say I'm available because I can answer your questions if you had them, but Adam would be available um, as well as your state uh, person that you work with. So never hesitate to reach out to, to the team if you have any questions about what you're seeing in the report. Yep, absolutely. And also, um, if no one has any other questions, I will just say um, we're working on planning an RSVP gathering for this year. Um, it'll be in late August, on August 23rd through 25th. Um, details are still getting worked out. We received a GLCI grant to help plan that so and pay for it. So um, we'll be inviting all the ranchers who are part of the network, as well as all of our partner organizations um, and so hopefully you can mark those dates down. It's going to be based out of Billings, but we'll um, we'll probably go out of Billings for a day at least. Um, and then the Educational Scholarship Fund, I just want to remind you that each ranch has $5,000 to spend on um, grazing schools, soil health workshops, ranching for profit, um, any sort of educational um, activities that you uh, are interested in participating in. So please, use that money because it's for you for each ranch. Um, and also that will be available in addition. So for the RSVP gathering, um, that will be on top of your $5,000. So um, make sure to reach out to your state person if you're interested in utilizing any of that funding for, especially for this season, since there's all, you know, so many things going on, so. Alexis, I have a question about that. Yeah. Um, at one time, I think maybe you were considering doing a ranching for profit for RSVP people. Mm -hmm. Is that still a possibility? So we were told by ranching for profit that they discouraged um, discouraged that sort of organizing of a, a specific school for a specific group because they say it's less likely that people will share information if they're like in a cohort that is with their like neighbors versus if they're with people who are from all over the country um that they they like to bring in a diversity of people into these groups and so when i approached them about that they thought they didn't really love that idea <laughs> so um so we're kind of at the point where we just pay for tuition for whatever school you decide to um attend so okay Thank you. I yeah. had seen where um, RSA had done like a abbreviated ranching for profit. Yeah. 
and that looked like a really cool idea, but those dates hadn't worked for me. So I'm, yeah. I'm looking for the abbreviated version. Okay. <laughs> well, we'll keep our eyes open and yeah, they will do an abbreviated version in different places. Um, and so maybe we could put something like that together. That's just like shorter. Sure. Sounds good. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Well, is that it? Um, if like like Alexa said, you know, feel free to reach out at any time. Uh, if anything comes up that you you realize you wanted to ask or anything, we're we're always here. So um, yeah, it's interesting to hear your insights too. So if you have any comments or just anything at all that you think would be interesting, uh, just let us know. So thank you very much. You want to close this out, Alexis, or am I closing this out right now? Yeah, good. <laughs> Okay, cool. All right, well, everybody have a good good rest of your morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thanks. See you all.